This week on the Backtable Podcast. The role of biopsy certainly has changed or evolved over the years. And before, it was just simply to make a diagnosis. And primarily, it was for malignancy. And in some cases, just to confirm what looked like it would be a benign diagnosis. But now, as everybody knows, it's the age of biomarkers. And so with biomarker sampling, you generally need more tissue than just to make a, a diagnosis. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Backtable Podcast. If you're a new listener, welcome. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back, and thank you guys for listening. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or really wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check out the website, find all of our previous episodes and some additional content. That website is backtable.com. Very easy to remember. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on one of our social media channels. Just let us know how we can make this podcast a better resource for our medical community and for you, and we're going to do our best to make that happen. We take the feedback really seriously. We read it all. Trust me. Now a quick word from our sponsor. Angiodynamics BioSentry Track Sealant System is the only FDA-cleared product to reduce lung complications during percutaneous biopsy and to provide a marker for visualization during surgical resection. It has been shown to reduce chest tubes by 80%, pneumothorax by 52%, and readmission by 39%. The biosentry system consists of a hydrogel plug placed through your existing coaxial transducer that doubles in size to seal the needle tract. Plug, prevent, and protect your patients during percutaneous biopsy. Now, back to the show. Today, we're going to be talking about techniques for a successful lung biopsy with Dr. Robert Sue. Dr. Sue is an IR doc out of UCLA. Rob? Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Before we jump into the topic, Rob, will you just tell us about your background and about your current practice and how it looks at UCLA? Yeah, so it's kind of interesting because way back when I did an interventional radiology fellowship and I was looking for jobs at the time, but there really weren't the best jobs in the mid-90s there for interventional radiologists, even though those were the only uh, positions they were hiring for. So my program director came up to me and said, hey, Rob, uh, how about going and getting some extra chest training and coming back and being our section chief? And that's what I would ended up doing is going and getting the chest training. And I was at Loma Linda for about two years. And eventually I ended up back at UCLA where I did my second fellowship in chest. And then it all started from there. At UCLA, we've got a unique practice in that it's very organ-specific, and so a lot of the interventional radiology work gets done out of the cross-sectional sections as well as the interventional radiology section in general. And so I've been able to focus my entire career pretty much in the chest and in the lung, both diagnostic and procedure-wise. Really? So the way it's kind of split up is like there's the thoracic section, and so that's you and a couple of other interventional radiologists and some body radiologists where all the thoracic interventions are done by like that group. Yes. Uh, So what we did was not to exclude anybody. We took everybody on the general IR side that was interested in performing lung procedures, as well as any thoracic radiologist who was doing high-end lung procedures, and we kind of made a group. Cool. All right. That's a good way. So tell me, in a given week, what does the board look like for you or even, you know, if you want to break it down by day, week, or month, what's your patient selection look like? What kind of cases are you guys doing? So for me personally, uh, I've kind of downsized my clinical practice only because I have additional academic and administrative responsibilities. So I'm pretty much doing procedures one to one and a half days and then clinic another half day. And then I do another day of diagnostic imaging. And then I have administrative days in the week. You know, in order to address patient uh, selection, as well as operator skill and locale, because we've increasingly expanded into the outpatient arena with most of our procedures. So we have a triage system. When it's your day to screen, you identify the patient needs and their typical ask for what they want for biopsy. We also look at the outpatient center, if it's appropriate for that. And if it can be done by 
kind of the general pool of thoracic skill set or does it need to be done at a higher level skill set? Because for instance, a one centimeter nodule, uh, there are few of us that do that, but not everybody in the lung group does those types of nodules. And so that's basically how we screen. So we make sure that it's appropriate for the patient and their lesion as the target, the locale in terms of outpatient versus hospital, and also the operator. And when you say hospital versus outpatient, like all the procedures or the lung biopsies are done as outpatients, just whether you want to do it at like the main UCLA campus versus like one of the satellites where you might not have like as many resources available? Correct. And the hospital setting is both at Westwood, UCLA, and also Santa Monica. Okay. Are there any patients that you guys need to see ahead of time to either talk with them or families or additional workup? Or are these patients like kind of teed up and ready to go for biopsy? In general, uh, we don't see patients beforehand in terms of a clinic visit unless they're, let's say, an ablation or potential ablation patient. Then we may talk about the biopsy beforehand. But we generally see the patients before the procedure as in most practices. But on occasion where patients or their families wanted to talk to the interventional radiologist to do the procedure or who's doing the procedure, then we certainly can set that up in a clinic setting. All right. So the patient gets to you guys day of the procedure. Um, What does the workup look like as far as you already have your imaging, they've already been approved for a biopsy. So just what are some of the things you get them ready for uh, either antibiotics wise or sedation wise? So I think the first thing is, uh, you know, you kind of look at the board and what's going on and go through the cases. Sometimes we have residents and fellows, as you can imagine. And so it's important to sit down and go through the target and kind of the needs of the patient and the procedure. And then when I see the patient, uh, it's really just kind of running through the procedure, just what they're going to expect. And then I like to conclude that with maybe some expectations that I have for them in that I think one of the keys to have a successful procedure, and especially a lung biopsy, is to put the ball back into the patient's court, so to speak, so that they feel like that they have some sort of skin in the game. And so one of the last things I lead with is I ask them if they remember when they had their CAT scan or PET scan, and if they remembered you know, that they took a big breath in and held it. And usually they go, yeah, yeah, I remember that that happened. And I go, here, we just want you to take a small, comfortable breath. Something that, you know, whether I ask them or our fellow or our technologist, just try to do it the same way each time. And I think in many cases that sort of takes the, I guess, the nervousness or the anxiety from the procedure because when they're laying there on the table, they're concentrating on something else and focusing on trying to do something else. Yeah, that's nice. So let's dig in a little bit to the breath hold thing. Are you basically talking to your patients ahead of time in anticipation that you may have to do some breath hold maneuvers throughout the case? Uh, in fact, we talked to all of them. Yeah, yeah, about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you do it on inspiration, expiration, or depends on where the lesion ends up? No, just a small breath in and hold it. So it's like end tidal inspiration. Okay. Are all the cases being done with moderate sedation, local? Yes. So, you know, every so often there may be a need for general anesthesia or deep conscious sedation, but most of the time they're going to be moderate or mild conscious sedation. Okay. So mild to moderate conscious sedation, keeping them kind of light so they're not completely snowed and obviously not able to comply with the breath hold. So you keep them a little bit light. Right. And yeah, of course, they're going to have to be awake or somewhat awake. In fact, over the years, I've gotten to use less and less benzodiazepines and narcotics. And so what I might do is start with uh, something like one milligram of Versed, 50 mics of Fent, and then I give something like uh, Toradol or IV acetaminophen to really give pain control if needed. But the secret to having a successful lung biopsy is really knowing how to numb the parietal pleura. Okay. Well, what we want to do is like uncover all the secrets. So like, uh, <laughs> let's, hear, let's hear about it. Yes. So, you know, again, if you think about it, probably one of the most sensitive structures that the needle crosses when it's going percutaneously from the skin into the lung into the lesion is the parietal pleura um, because it's somatically innervated just as the skin is. And so 
you know, the way that we numb up the pleura is that, you know, you bring the introducer needle or the 19 gauge coaxial needle we typically use for lung biopsy. And we kind of just carefully bring it up to the pleura. And you can kind of see the target is what's called the extra pleural space. And you'll see a little black band of fat there. And that's just inside the endothoracic fascia, but outside or superficial to the parietal pleura. The trick is to get your needle there and then go ahead and administer about 10 cc's of lidocaine or sometimes if it's a longer procedure like an ablation, we may put lupivacaine. But again, 10 cc is kind of the, the low minimum for me. I usually at least put 10 cc's, if not a little bit more. And then once that's numb, it makes the procedure go so much easier because the patient doesn't feel the needle moving or sort of tugging on the parietal pleura with respiration. And as you know, the lung itself doesn't have somatic nerves. So, you know, once you're in the lung, they don't feel it anyways. So once you have your needle at that position, once you inject the lidocaine, like say you're putting down like 10 ml of lidocaine or rupivacaine or, or rupivacaine, do you get that little lens shape fluid on, like you, you can see it on CT where you get like this little lens of fluid that's like covering the parietal pleura? Yeah, perfect, Chris. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, good, good. All right, I like it. So one of the other things you touched on, needle size. So whenever you do your biopsies, which kind of devices are you using? Which needle size are you guys using? So we're, we're typically using a 19-gauge introducer needle and a 20-gauge sampling needle. And these are the semi-automated type that you manually put out the capture chamber and then it clicks and cuts off the sample. You know, on occasion, if it's a, a large mass, you know, and it's pretty safe, I'll go ahead and use a 17-gauge introducer needle with an 18-gauge core. But again, I think for things like ground glass lesions, one centimeter, one and a half centimeter nodules, using the 17, 18 gauge does cause a bit of hemorrhage. Whereas hemorrhage isn't too much of a problem, but it's the coughing that the hemorrhage causes that that's a problem. One thing that I meant to mention, so I'll go back to it as far as your consent forms. Whenever you consent your patients, I assume there's all the standard stuff, you know, pain, bleeding, infection, risk of a pneumothorax, risk of needing additional surgery or a chest tube or something. Do you guys discuss rare instances of stroke or death for the consent? I, you know, uh, to kind of go back in time, way back early in my career, I had two big complications and they had to do with systemic air embolus. And so I kind of rethought, well, what should be in the consent or how should you approach the consent at that time? And I even consulted with our risk management lawyers at UCLA. And I think they gave some very practical advice, uh, which I still hold to today, is that I think when you do an informed consent or uh, you're talking about a procedure, it's really about making sure that the patient is informed about things that can commonly happen, right? And commonly is, you know, people's definitions vary a little bit, but, you know, things that you're most likely to anticipate or expect with the procedure. Now, things like air embolism, death, stroke, all these kind of things can certainly happen, but they're well under the 1% if that threshold. And so the advice that I got is, well, you can mention them in passing, but I don't think when you give the numbers that in, in terms of how often or frequent these things happen, the patient is not going to say no to the procedure based on that. And so again, you can mention these things in passing, but I generally don't. I think that's solid advice. I mean, they're, they're such outliers, but it's like one of those things, like if you haven't had that complication, you probably know another interventionalist who's been through it. And it's just one of those things that, you know, I don't want to overly alarm the patients for something that can be, you know, 999 times out of a thousand, like a very routine procedure. But at the same time, I was just curious about how you guys handled it. All right. So going back to the technique. So we said typically 19 gauge introducer with 20 gauge needle. Do you guys have pathology on site to evaluate the sample or tell you whether or not you have adequate tissue, non-necrotic tissue, something like that? So when we do the biopsies in the outpatients in the hospital setting, uh, we definitely have a cytopathologist on board for these cases. At Santa Monica, the outpatient site or center is just across the street. And so in those situations, certainly you can have a cytopathologist come. 
But when we're in the true outpatient imaging and intervention center, uh, then we don't have access to cytopathologists. And so here, basically, the sample is placed in formal and, and then ensured that it gets to pathology, but there is no on-site evaluation of the tissue. You can figure out which ones are going to be at the outpatient versus the um, hospital side. How do you triage which ones will need access to cyto and which ones won't? You know, that's a good question, Chris, but we really don't use that as a form of triage, as I mentioned, or, you know, in the algorithm that we kind of use to this day. I suppose if something looks very necrotic or it's been biopsied multiple times without a diagnosis at the time of screening, you kind of know that. And so in those situations, we may, you know, as a sort of another measure of screening, we may place that patient where cytopathology would be available. Mm-hmm. In our practice, we don't have good access to Cyto. I mean, we can get them like on request and it creates kind of a scheduling burden, but we do rebiopsies or if you think you're going to be in necrotic tissue and so you are you have like a lot of opportunity to redirect the needle. But sometimes I think like if you have a one centimeter nodule and your, your Cyto tech says, hey, we don't have good tissue. I mean, you know, some of the things that we biopsy are exceedingly small now. I mean, like what more can you do other than like make a couple more passes and then keep your fingers crossed? So I was just curious. No, I think you're right. I mean, it, I think we're being asked to get smaller and smaller, right? So uh, the ones that we often do, the higher skill set biopsies, if you will, they're all routinely about a centimeter, centimeter and a half in tight locations. And so you're right. How much more tissue can I get uh, safely, right? Is there any size threshold to which you guys will not biopsy? In general, no. Well, I mean, again, size threshold, I mean, we've biopsied successfully three and four millimeter nodules. I think kind of the rule of thumb for us is that if you can see the nodule on soft tissue windows, then it's probably <laughs> fair game. Um, okay. But it's also kind of where the nodule's located. So a, you know, five millimeter nodule down by the diaphragm might be uh, very tricky unless you have a very good patient with good breath holding. Certainly, you know, a five millimeter, four millimeter nodule up in the apex or in the upper lung may be very easy to get. Right. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about size and location and basically like how the lungs look. How do you approach these patients when you have like a nodule that's FDG avid, it's up in the lung apex, but it's just surrounded by emphysema? I mean, it just seems like it's emphysema and then the nodule. What's y'all's approach to it, something like that? Well, you know, in the old days, I guess, you just try to find a little passageway to get in there to go through as best as we can say, as normal lung as possible right, uh, right. To, to minimize crossing the emphysematous cyst. Certainly, it's not worth going through a bulla because those are going to end in chronic air leaks that they'll never shut down. But this is also where we can now collaborate with our interventional pulmonology colleagues because they can maybe access this from inside. So y'all have a pretty good relationship with interventional pulm? Yeah, no, it's been great. I mean, I don't know what their numbers are, but obviously they're not taking away from us because we're busier than ever. So I think it's good for the system and good for patient care that you have multiple routes of tissue a access. Sure. Seems to be, in terms of lung nodule biopsies, plenty of work to go around. This is another scenario. How about the nodule that it's not pleural base, but it's just right outside the pleura? And so, like one of the challenges that I see with those nodules is that if you go the shortest distance from skin to target, you have so little purchase within actual lung parenchyma. I'm interested to see, do you approach that in any different way? So I know there's a traditional teaching, always go the shortest route possible or cross as little as lung as possible. But I think for truly subpleural lesions that are maybe one and a half to two centimeters or smaller, the better approach is to cross as much lung as you can in a tangential fashion. And it was interesting because way back when, uh, Mike Wallace out of MD Anderson had a nice paper looking at yield and complications related to two centimeter and smaller lesions within the subpleural lung. And what they found is simply that, you know, if you come tangential and cross lung as much as lung as possible, the yields are substantially better than if you come at it the short, very perpendicular approach. 
interestingly enough, they had more complications with the long approach. And uh, I think there was another paper by Co in radiology that showed that you're making a more oblong hole, uh, which is technically bigger than a more a rounder hole from a perpendicular approach. But I've not really seen that to bear out in uh, sort of real life. Uh, so I, we always approach these types of areas and nodules in a tangential or long approach. And what you really are striving for is to have the nodule and the needle move consistently as much as possible. And if you go into the lung and you, let's say you have three centimeters in a tangential approach to get to the, the nodule, as you're steering to that nodule, the tip and the nodule will move together more or less, and you'll ensure needle tip and nodule consistency through respiration. So along that vein, in terms of once you have your needle in position, and ideally needle and nodule are moving together in respiration, so you're going to go take your passes. Between each pass, do you replace the stylet? And then are you imaging between passes? So again, we're taking samples uh, with the same breath hole. You know, as you scan, you know, as you're moving your needle to the nodule and you have repetitive scanning, you start getting a feel for how the nodule and how the needle tip relationship becomes, right? So with the breath holds, again, if, if they're good, then you're going to have a very consistent relationship. You know, we breath hold, take the sample, and then we put the stylet back in, and then I let the patient breathe, obviously. You know, I don't really rescan in between samples because the, the proof's in the needle, right? If you open the chamber and it looks like there's a core of tissue there that looks consistent with the target, then you kind of know that you've gotten good samples or representative sample potentially. If for some reason, let's say you had good yield the first couple passes on a small nodule, but then the third or fourth pass starts looking a little bloody and kind of flaky, then in those situations, sure, you should rescan and make sure the needle didn't jump forward or it's completely off, uh, you know, in terms of the angle or trajectory. Well, once you've made that first pass, that pristine look that you had at the nodule sometimes can be pretty obscure depending on if there's any bleeding around it. We have plenty of trainees who listen to the podcast, Rob, but can you kind of unpack what a good biopsy sample might look like when you uh, unsheath it? <laughs> I think what you're looking for is something that's kind of whitish or tan. When you sort of unsheath that sample, you're like, oh, you know, if you see a little tan core, maybe if it's a small nodule, let's say it's a five millimeter nodule, that tan core may be five millimeters long. And then there may be some bloody tissue kind of on the backside or the deep side of it. And then you feel pretty good. You know, we do touch preps and, and not aspirations or FNAs. And so, you know, sometimes how they do the touch prep, you may not get all of the cells or any cells onto the slide. And so it really is kind of experience and sometimes just kind of taking a leap of faith. If you're getting reasonable cores, but they're not seeing anything on the touch preps, you take a few more cores and then you kind of say, okay, well, I, I'm going to trust my judgment and my experience and leave it at that. Well, I think it also goes back to the point where your pathology says they don't see anything, but you know, you're biopsying a five millimeter nodule. You've already made four passes. It's like, good luck trying to find that nodule again and like have an improved positioning. So how many cores do you take roughly ballpark? That's a really good question because I think the role of biopsy certainly has changed or evolved over the years. And before, it was just simply to make a diagnosis, and primarily it was for malignancy, and in some cases just to confirm a, what looked like it would be a benign diagnosis. But now, as everybody knows, it's the age of biomarkers, and so with biomarker sampling, you generally need more tissue than uh, just to make a, a diagnosis. And so here, again, there are many papers, but really very few that tell you how many cores you need to take to get uh, adequate sampling. But uh, in general, if I'm using the tissue retrieval device, then I'll generally minimum four, but I try to get between six and eight. Okay, nice. It's good tissue there. You know, again, I think if you look at some of the papers and what I've been able to extrapolate, 
if you assume about 90, 95% cellularity of the target, then two one centimeter passes with an 18 gauge end hole biopsy device generally can run next generation sequencing. And if you are using, for instance, a side hole 18 gauge gun, then it's about a two to one. And if you're using a 1920 system with a 20 sampling, then it's about roughly about four to five to one compared to the side. You know, you're taking a reasonable amount given, you know, if you're using the smaller needle. I think it's also like a good opportunity to kind of confer with your pathologist. And, you know, it's always good to be checking your samples, you know, ask them how much they need. And then as you're giving them tissue, you know, you have that feedback with the pathology group. I always think it's just good to collaborate with our pathology colleagues who always feel like you get what you get and you don't say shit was like the expression that one of my old attendants <laughs> used to say. And, you know, but I think it's like we're, we're evolved past that now where like if you just kind of work with them to help get them the tissue, but still minimize the invasiveness of the procedure. No, I I totally agree, Chris. It's it's really about communication and dialogue with your pathologist because at some places they're running so many immunohistochemistries off the slides that they exhaust the tissue just making the diagnosis. So there has to be sort of tissue protocols in place uh, in terms of uh, you know how many slides they're going to run for uh, IHC versus what are you going to hold over for potential next generation sequencing if needed. Yeah, for sure. So once you've taken your samples, you have good tissue, either by pathology or just your gestalt case is done, pull the needle, blood patch, anything else? Well, okay, the blood patch, yeah. So so I think majority of people just pull the needle out, right? I, I think you're completely right about that. <laughs> right, right. And then they just, you know, maybe put the patient to pen in and hope for the best, right? So historically, I've used the blood patch, and maybe it's because I did my residency and interventional radiology fellowship at Loma Linda, and one of the earliest, if not the first papers on blood patching came uh, out of Loma Linda by a guy named Ronald McCartney. But in 74 and 75, he described in two papers the blood patching technique in the first, and then I think they ran a series of about 50 patients in the second. And so I'm, for very long, I've used the blood patch just because of how I was trained and my familiarity with it. And that all started to change in the mid-2000s. We participated in a a trial for the hydrogel plug called BioSeal back then. After the trial, the plug kind of disappeared and then eventually resurfaced after it was FDA approved uh, in 2013. And it was called BioSentry, not BioSeal anymore. And so uh, we did some work with the biocentry and having some familiarity with it. And so what I started to do with that was to put it in every biopsy where we cross lung. And then I kept the same follow-up routine in some patients for the first 50, I think. Then I started to ratchet the observation time downwards. So today, I pretty much put the biocentry in every patient. I keep the patient on the table for three to five minutes, and then we do our posts. And if there is no pneumothorax and it was an uncomplicated, straightforward biopsy, I just send the patient home within 30 minutes, and I don't even get a chest x-ray. Wow, that's nice. I really now have to dig into this. Okay, so... (laughs) Biocentry, hydrogel. Is this the same hydrogel material? Like, I don't know if you're familiar with Terumo's coils. They have a hydrogel coil. Is it a similar material? You know, I'm not really familiar because I'm not really using uh, some of those vascular products. Okay. So what exactly is the hydrogel? Is that too technical of a question? I mean... No, it's basically a, a polymer, right, as anything else. And it's really highly desiccated. So it's like a little straw, about 2.5 centimeters. And you can prime it by putting a little saline or lidocaine in the well as you're deploying it. But it's supposed to pick up, you know, the moisture from the tissues. And within five minutes, it should fully expand. So it's about four times the volume. It grows in length as well as in width to plug that parenchymal, but more importantly, the hole in the visceral pleura. 
does it go through just the introducer needle that you had in for the biopsy? Correct. And so it goes with the 19 gauge introducer, but you can also use the 17 gauge introducer. There's a handle that you set the skin to plural depth, and then it pushes the plug down where ideally uh, with a two and a half centimeter plug, two centimeters is within the lung uh, or the subplural lung, and then about five millimeters hangs out. And as that grows, it crosses both the lung and the pleura. If you're deploying that hydrogel, can you still do the deployment? Because you mentioned if you have like an uncomplicated biopsy, but let's say like you have a biopsy where you have like a very small pneumothorax that you see during the biopsy. So you're getting your needle in position. It's not one of those ones where like the lung is just like totally deflating that you have to address on the table. It's just like a little small sliver of a pneumo, same deployment and everything. That's a great question. <laughs> so, so yes, more or less. So what, what you do is, uh, let's say you've taken all your samples and you, you're about to take the needle out. And so before you take the needle out, you should always scan the patient so you know kind of what the lay of the land is. And instead of measuring from the skin to the pleura, right, if you had no pneumothorax, what you do is you still measure skin to pleura, but you have to measure to the visceral pleura. So if the lung is down two centimeters, then you're going to add, let's say, another two centimeters to that length, right? So you'll still deploy it within the lung, and uh, it'll be hanging out into the pleural space where the pneumothorax or the air is also there. And then if it's large enough, what you do is just put the coaxial needle or the introducer needle back into the pleural space and simply aspirate it. Yeah, just suck it out as you're kind of pulling it out. Right, and I think people sometimes don't interpret pneumothorax the right way. I mean, they get bothered by the pneumothorax, but having a pneumothorax is relatively inconsequential. It's really whether or not you have an active air leak, right? And so by putting the introducer needle back into the pleural space, aspirating on the air, when you feel the lung sucking up against the needle, you can just wait 30 seconds, a minute, couple minutes. You know, after that, if you can't suck any more air out, that means that you plug the hole or the hole is sealed and it's a non-issue at that point. The biosentry device, can you work it in like normal parenchyma in addition to like if you have some really like crummy emphysematous lungs towards the apices, it's still fair game for deployment? No issues there? Yeah, you can put it in obviously unhealthy lung or tissue, but I don't think anybody really knows if it works as well. And I don't get the sense it does because... For instance, if you put it in a lot of emphysema or cystic lung, I know from our study that because the substrate of the lung is so abnormal, there's not a tight seal along that plug, even though the plug has expanded and air can still probably leak out because the cyst walls just aren't as tightly wrapped around the plug. And so in interstitial lung disease, it's a little bit the same way with fibrosis, uh, not being kind of more compliant lung. And so in those situations, those are patients that I would certainly watch longer and do chest x-rays kind of like more old school, uh, like a previous practice, as opposed to what I do with kind of the healthy, straightforward cases. Gotcha. Easy to use? I'm sure anyone can go and look up a picture. What is it? Is it bulky? Is it small? Is it just like a little device that you go and throw in? Does it take 20 minutes to prep? I was just kind of looking for like ease of use because, you know, there's plenty of like good devices out there, but if they're like become like as cumbersome as like actually doing the procedure, it becomes more of a headache and a hindrance to actually getting it done. Right. No, I, I get it because you don't want to make things more complicated in, in your daily life. I, th I think it's a pretty easy to use device. It just simply comes with a, a little canister, right, that lure locks with a plug in it. And it has a handle uh, that you set the skin to plural depth. And then you lock it in and it's sort of, like I said, a pusher that goes over your coaxial needle and it sort of abuts the skin. Um, and then once it's flush with the skin, then you pull the coaxial or introducer needle up into the handle. And so it pushes the plug to the certain depth you want and then it basically unsheath it at that location. So, you know, like with anything, there is a little learning curve, but it's pretty small with this. I think the things that people make errors with or operators have problems with is sometimes they push the plug in too deep and so it's completely embedded within the lung or they're not fast enough in terms of putting the plug in and, and it gets stuck in the needle. 
And in part, maybe they didn't flush the needle because may have, there have been some black back bleeding and kind of a stickiness, as you know. And so I think one of the tricks is maybe flush the needle, especially if you're starting to get some blood back into the cannula. And what I'll do is I'll take a few millimeters off my calculated depth because, you know, as I mentioned before, the ideal location is two centimeters in with half a centimeter out, but you could do 50-50, right, if you wanted to. And that way, it sort of prevents you from putting it too deep. Okay. The other thing I wanted to ask you about, and, and this was what really grabbed my attention, because I'll just tell you in our practice, whether we do blood patch, routine, complicated, it's three hours hold, one hour chest x-ray, and then the, a three hour chest x-ray, and if that one looks good, they can go. You're sending some of these patients home like 30 minutes after biopsy, basically just enough to let the anesthesia wear off, no x-ray? That's correct. That is great. All right. So <laughs> say you didn't have the biocentric. What's the old school way of Yale's protocol? The way I used to practice, and still some of us do, because not everybody has kind of gone my way, you know, right? So I have to say that this is something I do, but not everybody in the group practices the same way. So how I used to do the follow-up is like very much like what you've already uh, elucidated. You know, they go back to the observation, but they lay in that position or dependent side down for about an hour and a half, first chest x-ray, then a second chest x-ray at about three hours to four hours, somewhere in that period. And then if that looks okay, then the patients were allowed to go. And I think some of that follow-up really harks back to some of the literature on pneumothorax after lung biopsy, given that most of the biopsy that had pneumothoraces occurred in that first hour. But the far majority happened in the next three hours after that first hour. And so that's why people generally keep their patients three to four hours in the past. Despite having used the blood patch for so many years, we still had some delayed pneumothoraces that showed up on that second chest x-ray and a few over the years after they went home. And we kind of looked at that uh, as well uh, with our initial blood patch stuff. So I think in 124 consecutive patients, about six of them have delayed pneumothoraces with the blood patch, but only one required a chest tube. And so, you know, if you see, I guess, the pneumothorax on the second chest x-ray or getting a little bit larger, then, you know, you just naturally get another one after that. Yeah. So what is y'all's practice in terms of if you have a pneumothorax? I, th I think it's always easy. It's like the pneumothorax where the patient's symptomatic and enlarging. It's like, okay, no brainer, put a chest tube. Can you kind of walk me through your algorithm? Which pneumothoraces are getting watched and which pneumothoraces are getting intervened? So... I think the biggest thing is when you have a large enough pneumothorax on the table, it's important to do something about it then. And it saves you a lot of headache later because that way you don't rely on these indirect methods to ascertain whether or not you have an air leak. So indirect methods would be like repetitive chest x-rays, right? So if you have a large enough pneumothorax on the table, simply put a catheter or put the introducer needle back in, aspirate the air, and like I said, once you get all the air out and the lung is sucking up against the needle, uh, if you wait and observe and maybe scan a little bit uh, if needed, but if you keep the patient on the, let's say for five minutes, you'll know if you've got an active air leak or not. And if you don't have an active air leak, it's kind of done and the air is out of the pleural space for the most part. Again, you're going to get good visceral parietal pleural apposition when you put that patient dependent and it's probably going to be a non-issue. If you do have active air leak, then by aspirating, it helps you because now you could triage how fast that air leak is going. And so now you could say, well, this person, we got to put a chest tube in, but they'll do fine with a Heimlich versus I need to admit the patient and put them on wall suction because the air leak is so rapid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you guys worked to differentiate the parenchymal, the blood patch from something called the pleural blood patch where you do some pleural injection with like a higher volume, like 50 to 60 cc's of the patient's blood? Well, I know that technique was elaborated by the group out at Wisconsin with Fred Lee. And, you know, I think you try anything that's going to help you in the long run because I mean, we're all very busy, and the last thing we want to do is keep adding to the bottom of our to-do list, right? 
And so sometimes we'll do that. Uh, we'll put in 20, 30 cc's of ivy or fresh blood back into the pleural space. But again, I think it works better if you have less air in the pleural space, right? Because then, of course, if let's say the patient is prone and you have a posterior lung puncture and let's say, you know, you got, you know, a reasonable size pneumothorax, well, you could put the blood in and then put the patient supine and get those pleural surfaces to touch and so the blood sort of dependent in there. But you have a better chance of success, in my opinion, if you take all the air out because now you're coupling the blood plus the hydrostatic coupling between the visceral and parietal pleura, right? So I think in any case, you could put those in or put the pleural blood in, but I would still recommend or advocate for taking the air out first. Right. Like you said, there's probably better apposition of the blood between the visceral and the parietal pleura if you've evacuated that potential space. Yeah, completely agree. All right. Is there anything, Rob, that I didn't bring up? As you said earlier, like one of the secrets to a good case, like is there anything I didn't ask you about that you need to share with us or our audience? Well, I just wanted to circle back to the use of the hydrogel plug because the group at Memorial Sloan, the paper by Maybody, they did look at that and found that the blood patch was non-inferior to the hydrogel plug. But I don't know. I, I just never felt as comfortable uh, with the blood patching as I do with the hydrogel plug, probably because the hydrogel stays where you put it, whereas the blood sort of diffuses out of the track potentially. I use the plug on everybody, and I kind of think it's it's like a good sauce. You can use it on everything. All right. I like that. <laughs> I don't know. I think, uh, you know, meticulous technique, spend a little time on patient positioning. Don't settle for just prone and supine, but sometimes we'll bump up the side. And it's not really just bumping up the side, but sometimes we'll put in a very focal cushion to get the back to Let's say if the patient is prone, maybe you want to open up that rib space a little bit more so you could put like a little small pillow or sort of a towel ball, I guess, so that the patient extends and then the ribs and the spine open up better and it just allows you for better access. I totally agree with that. I just want to second that for some of our younger audience and some of the trainees is that you do not have to settle for the positioning that your techs and nurses put the patient in like when you walk into the room. Sometimes like it's having the arm down. Sometimes it's having the arm up. Like you never know that what just tweaks that rib in just the right way that something that was like previously just hiding under like the ninth rib, all of a sudden it opens up and it's like light from the heavens that make the biopsy a thousand times easier. So just a little on the front end can make everything easier on the back end. I'm, I'm with you, Rob. Yeah, for sure. And then the other thing is that, you know, I think a lot of people turn down biopsies because they look at the diagnostic and they go, oh, no, it's behind the rib. But these are all relative. I mean, you can position the patient, you know, to move things around, as you said, that makes something that looked inaccessible, completely accessible uh, if you spend a little bit of time and working with the patient. I think if you do these enough, you feel like they always look accessible on the CT, like the pre-procedure scan. And then for whatever reason, your first scan, it's like they're always <laughs> immediately behind the rib. You always think like, what's the luck? Like it always feels like that. I, you know, it's just, you know, negativity bias and what you remember. Yeah. All right, Rob, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Chris. It's been my pleasure. Happy holidays. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. So to our audience, thank you for listening. If you guys enjoy the podcast but want more, check out the show notes of this episode. Those are going to be able to be found at backtable.com. And remember, the show notes are where you can find that link for some free CME. Very nice. For others interested in supporting the show, like, subscribe, and share this podcast on social media, or just go old school, tell somebody about it. That really works out. Um, that wraps things up. We'll see you next time on the Backtable Podcast. Thanks again, Rob. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz.
article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.